So our next speaker is Dr. David Ioniti. Um, he is the chief of HPV surgery at Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. He is also the program director of the HPV fellowship program and a professor of surgery. From a clinical perspective, Dr. Ioniti specializes in innovative interventional treatments for tumor ablation. So welcome, Dr. Ioniti. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, again, I want to thank the, the um, Wamans for inviting me to uh, speak once again. And I think this is a really fantastic conference that they put on. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the chief of HPV surgery. You know, he was asking themselves, what the heck is HPV surgery? I don't even know. I can't even spell it myself. But uh, basically what I do is liver and pancreas surgery. And that's all I do every day, all day long. So I don't do any colon surgery or gastric surgery. I just do a compatibility surgery, and my career has been spent developing those surgical techniques. So I've been asked to talk about where the role of surgery may play a role in the management of patients with uh, neuroendocrine tumor. So here's where I live currently. I'm a New Englander, but uh, I currently live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and that's where I work at Carolina's Medical Center. It's about a thousand bed hospital. It's a part of Carolina's healthcare system, which is a 44 hospital system. And uh, it's actually the second largest not-for-profit hospital system in the United States after the VA. So it's a very busy place. Uh, and this is sort of the center where all the uh, quaternary level care services are provided. And part of the system is Levine Cancer Institute, which also uh, is an attempt to uh, standardize cancer care throughout the Carolinas. And so here's my uh, HPV surgery team. Uh, we have uh, great physicians that I work with and mid-level providers, nursing staff, and other staff. and researchers. And so without these guys, uh, we really uh, be difficult to move things forward. So I want to talk uh, primarily about surgery and potentially where the role of surgery comes in in terms of treatment of neuroendocrine. Today we're going to, if everybody's comfortable with it, try to show a couple of surgical videos uh, so you have an understanding of kind of the things that we're talking about. I've built my entire career on ablative technologies and I do a lot of that. So like, and I know there's going to be another talk this afternoon, so I'm just going to touch on it briefly with a little bit of outcomes maybe just to sell some of the newer innovative surgical or ablative technologies that are out there. I don't think I need to go through this. I think this room is very well aware of uh, neuroendocrine and the definitions and whatnot, and as well as the incidence of the disease. When you look at what I do, you know, there's about two-thirds of patients have uh, GI, uh, neuroendocrine or carcinoids, uh, and you can see pancreas only is responsible for a very, very small percentage. So I have a very actually small role in the overall management of patients with neuroendocrine tumor. I think it's an important role for those that counts, but um, overall relatively small. The When you're thinking about tumors and how to manage tumors, I think it's most important to understand the biology of disease, okay? Because when you're picking a treatment modality or a combination of treatment modalities, Understanding how that tumor behaves is primarily important. And so when we see a local or low-grade small tumor, that's a local disease. And that disease should be treated with a local therapy. Now, as the disease becomes more aggressive and more high-grade, then not only thinking of it as a local disease, but considering it to be a regional disease. So combination of regional and local therapy makes sense. When it starts spreading to things like lymph nodes, that's a regional disease where maybe a local therapy is not adequate. Systemic therapy might be a little too much, so you're trying to figure that out. And then once you get to metastatic disease, that's a systemic disease. I'm a surgeon. I provide local and regional therapy. So everything that we do needs to be in conjunction in the context that I'm dealing with a systemic disease. And that's a very important concept to uh, understand as a treating physician. So when you look at liver metastases, when these tumors spread to the liver, which we see pretty much every day, um, if you left that untreated, unlike other liver metastases, you know, you're looking at generally about a 40% five-year survival. Sure, there's lots of variabilities in those numbers, but you could give you a little bit of a sense. When we deal with other diseases like pancreatic cancer, as well as a metastatic colorectal cancer, that number is actually relatively good for some of the other diseases that we treat. Not good for you if you have it. But we also have learned throughout the years that an aggressive approach to remove or destroy all or as much of that disease as possible can actually even double your survival 
and in addition, significantly lower symptoms, particularly if these are active uh, tumors. And so again, when we're talking about the different therapies out there, there are systemic therapies, regional therapies. You know, plenty of talks about systemic therapies with uh, long-acting uh, octreotide, lanreotide, um, uh, Affinitor, uh, Sepent. And again, I don't really need to go over that. I'm not a medical oncologist. We're going to have a great lecture very soon about regional therapy, which is a huge part of the management, particularly when we develop uh, liver metastases. And there's different terms and things that you'll see. You'll hear pedagogy infusion, bland embolization, chemoembolization, deb case or drug eluding B chemoembolization, radioembolization. And it really, there's a lot of details that are involved treatments there, and again, you're going to hear that a little bit later. What I would like to focus on are the last two right there, liver resection and hepatic tumor ablation, because that's primarily what I do. And so there's been a, throughout the years, I would say that there's been a relative uh, perception regarding liver surgery. What does everybody think when you think about liver surgery? These big open operations like this, and we used to do this, big retractors, massive amounts of blood loss, patients are really sick, a lot of them die and whatnot. And I'm happy to say, along with other uh, therapies, or most other therapies, there's been a le an evolution. And, and fortunately, I'm very proud to say that we've been very actively involved in the evolution of how we technically do liver surgery. And just like we do minimally invasive surgery for colons and stomachs and gallbladders, we're pretty much on the forefront of doing minimally invasive liver surgery, which has been great. And we're one of the few places in the United States that trains and teaches that. And this has really been popularized since around 2008. Was it 2015? So it really hasn't been around. Certainly, minimally invasive HPV surgery has definitely lagged behind general surgery, primarily because of the magnitude of the operations. But with the development of better surgical techniques, as well as the development of energy devices and stapling devices and what have you, we've been able to sort of co-evolve these technologies with surgical techniques to bring us to modern HPV surgery, which I would hope or want to believe is most really minimally invasive, which is the situation that I'm in. So if you guys are comfortable, I want to kind of show you what a liver resection looks like. Is anybody concerned here? Anything like that? So this is a gentleman. He is a, a police officer, excuse me, a fireman, who uh, had a routine chest x-ray as part of their screening, had a, um, liver, a lung nodule that prompted a CT scan, which then led to uh, the identification of this lesion here in the left lobe of the liver. So we're looking from the belly button up, and that sort of liver-colored thing is the liver. Uh, you can see some of the suspensory ligaments, and there's the diaphragm. So the heart is just on the other side of that retractor. Now, when we do liver surgery, from a principal point of view, we don't change anything that we do between laparoscopically and open. So the cancer principles need to be exactly the same. We have a lot less control when we're doing liver surgery laparoscopically but understanding intrahepatic vascular anatomy and um, general use or liberal use of intraoperative ultrasound to identify vessels and blood vesicles, we can generally do it very safely. We, we do, in our institution, about 250 laparoscopic liver resections per year. So we're very aggressive about it. This is one of the energy devices that I'm talking about. And the development of these devices has then allowed us to carry out minimally invasive surgery you want to have a sense, if you think about your cardiac output, your liver takes about 20% of your cardiac output. And so if you have a cardiac output of, say, four, so your blood is pumping four to five liters per minute through your body, and 20% of that goes through your liver, so you're putting about a liter of blood through your liver per minute. So you can imagine, if we get into a little bit of blood loss, which can happen, it doesn't take very long to run out of blood. So again, we're very careful, and you can see when people have this perception of you know, ma massive blood loss liver resections, which we have on occasion, you can see that, again, with modern techniques, with energy devices, and this is a stapling device, that we're very safely and carefully can go through that liver. And you can see there's, you know, on a good day, there's almost uh, no blood loss here. And the nice thing is that this definitely saves people from a lot of the pain and suffering. Upper abdominal surgery is generally very uncomfortable. When you do open upper abdominal surgery, you have big retractors that are pulling and lifting on the ribs and oftentimes will bruise the ribs and break ribs and break cartilage just from retraction. And that being able to do this laparoscopically definitely decreases pain, post-operative pain, length of hospital stay, 
wound complications, wound infection rates. So from a morbidity point of view, if this procedure can be done well, definitely associated with less pain and suffering, and there's no oncologic disadvantages to doing these procedures laparoscopically versus open. So again, if you need a liver resection, God forbid you do, um, minimally invasive is a nice way to go. So when we look at the outcomes for liver resections for neuroendocrine tumors, you can see there that even if we don't get a complete negative resection and that we even did bulk, if you have an active disease like a carcinoid or other secreting tumor, that you can get, and most of the symptoms, by the way, come from liver disease. So if you have an active tumor, your liver volume oftentimes directly correlates with the severity of your symptoms or signs. And so we know that at least by debulking, if not completely eradicating the disease, is associated with a very high percentage of symptom control, which from a quality of life point of view is certainly fantastic. And if you look at five-year survivals, remember, untreated overall five-year survival is about 40%. We can increase those survivals up to the 70, 80 you know, percent range, and that's fantastic. So I think that there is some validity to consideration of liver-directed therapy for liver metastases from neuroendocrine tumor. Now, unfortunately, most of the people that we see who have liver metastases are not candidates to have all of their tumor completely removed. By far, most of what we see, whether it be neuroendocrine, metastatic colorectal, cholangio, whatever you have, most people are unresectable for a lot of reasons. And so for us, we need to figure out other ways that we can do it because we know that if we can manage the liver disease, it's associated with improvement in symptomatology as well as an improvement in survival. If most patients are unresectable, then we need to figure out other things that we can do to try to treat the tumors in the liver. And that's where the role of hepatic tumor ablation comes in. I wouldn't view them as co uh, competitive technologies, but certainly complementary, where sometimes we'll resect some of the liver and ablate some, or we'll do staged procedures. But again, it's important that if you're dealing with liver disease, Having all the technologies available is critically important for maximum care. And so, again, there's going to be a talk about ablation in a little bit. I've spent my entire career developing all of these technologies, and there's a lot of them out there. And so, again, I'm, not going, to, I'm going to go through every one in painful detail. So the primary modalities that we use, uh, radiofrequency, microwave, a little bit of HIFU, and the newest kid on the block is something called irreversible electroporation, which uh, should be used very selectively. So I started off my career in ablation uh, doing open cryosurgery, basically uh, working with uh, this uh, senior surgical oncologist, and we would do an open liver, we'd carve out as much of the tumor as we could, and then we would actually have pitchers of liquid nitrogen in the OR and pour the liquid nitrogen in the holes in the liver. Happy to say we've come a long way since then and uh, dealt a few burns of staph uh, with pouring liquid nitrogen. We learned how to make ice cream pretty well. Um, and so we came to insulated cryoprobes, and it actually was the first person to publish on how to do laparoscopic cryoablation back in the mid-90s. And we know that, again, from an ablative therapy, historical data, ablative therapy for liver-only liver metastases is associated with an improvement in survival over standard or systemic therapy only. So again, there's been a, um, an evolution of these uh, treatments. And so in October of 1997, so really in 1998, radiofrequency ablation became available. And again, this is putting an electrode into tissue and passing electric current. And this has been the mainstay of ablation throughout the world for probably about a decade. Different systems that are out there, you'll hear about that a little bit more. But honestly, radiofrequency ablation has given way to, or should give way to, microwave ablation. There really, in my opinion, is no more role for monopolar radiofrequency ablation, and that the current um, uh, systems of microwave uh, are probably much more effective than RF ever was. And so it works uh, from a physics point of view very differently. There is no risk of thermal sinks and electrical sinks that you get with radio frequency. So you have much more consistent ablation or destruction volumes. Um, this is just sort of what an ablation procedure looks like. This is a patient, obviously, with a, a metastatic liver disease. Um, had previous abdominal surgery, and when you do laparoscopic surgery, you need to be willing to deal with adhesions. Oftentimes, that's usually the rate limiting factor. 
you can see this is this liver looks a lot different than a healthy fireman, right? This is a chemo liver. This is what your liver looks like after rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds of chemo. It's just a fatty, boggy liver. Uh, other um, drugs will have a different effect in terms of vascular congestion of the liver. So, you know, we love chemotherapy selectively and in a limited fashion, but there is a price to pay for chemotherapy. Now, again, I'm going to again, advocate that whether you come to talk about surgical resection versus ablation versus uh, regional uh, liver-directed therapy versus systemic therapy, they're all complementary. So it's not one or the other. So there's a lesion you can see on the dome of the liver. And this is a couple of uh, 915 microwave antennas being passed laparoscopically through the abdominal wall. And everything we do is under ultrasound guidance. So the surgeon has to be very, very good at intraoperative ultrasound, which is definitely a learned skill. Um, I do all the ultrasound courses for general surgeons so, um, in the United States. And what we're able to do is completely destroy that tumor. We figured out a lot of tricks that we've learned through laparoscopic cryo and laparoscopic RF that we now apply to microwave. There's some differences in the details. But again, we can effectively be very aggressive when it comes to treating liver disease, uh, again, in a minimally invasive way, in a very effective way with microwave ablation. So one of the shticks of uh, radiofrequency ablation is that you can't adequately destroy tumors that are greater than three centimeters. So microwave completely overcomes that. So you can see on the left, there's a large liver tumor that's a metastatic colorectal cancer, but with modern microwave devices, we can completely destroy whatever we want. Um, generally, we try not to knock out more than a third of the liver at a time, but if we wanted to kill the entire liver, we could. I'm not saying we should. Um, but again, some of the perspectives of ablation technology are really lingering from the RF days and not relevant to the microwave days. So again, we've published a lot of series in terms of uh, our outcomes, and you can see that we find that surgical ablations are, are probably a bit more effective than percutaneous ablations because we find more disease when we operate on somebody and we can be more aggressive surgically, so our local and regional recurrence rates are a lot less than those patients who are treated with perc ablations. So, and if you look at our overall survivals in the green line actually represents metastatic neuroendocrine tumor, that we're getting some pretty good overall survival when it comes to treatment of these diseases, particularly with liver-only liver metastases. So I just want to highlight some of the things that maybe in the past people may have had the perception that you're untreatable or not surgically treatable. And so there's a picture right here. You can see multiple liver metastases. And I don't expect you guys to be a radiologist. I don't have a pointer. I don't know what this thing is. It's a lighter. I don't have a smoke. Um, all the spots in the liver, those are metastases. And we have bilobar metastatic disease. And sometimes when you hear the term bilobar, bilobar people are implying that it is not surgically resectable, ablatable, or treatable. I would say that the devil is in the details. And so, sure, this is bilobar disease, multiple liver metastases in both lobes. Every segment of the liver has tumor, big dominant tumor in the right. So what we're going to do in this situation is we're going to do a staged procedure. So we can go in laparoscopically and take out the right lobe of the liver. Okay, and so there's the posterior section. We've taken out the right lobe of the liver laparoscopically, a little bit of fluid back there. Still have uh, multiple lesions on the left lobe. We let the liver sort of recover. And about six weeks later, we'll go back in laparoscopically and we'll go ahead and ablate the rest of the lesion. So you can see those little surgical marking clips, and all that dark area is destroyed tumor. So again, we might not be able to do things in a single setting, but again, particularly when something like neuroendocrine, it opens up an opportunity potentially for staged liver resection, so as you can see here, resection and ablation. This is a patient with um, um, metastatic neuroendocrine, primary pancreatic head neuroendocrine tumor, not the picture of health, was told that there's nothing to be done for him, with 10 liver metastases and a tumor in the head of the pancreas. And so uh, here's his MRI. You can see a few of the lesions in his liver, about 10 of them. So we chose to temporize his liver with um, radioembolization, and we treated the tumor in the head of his pancreas with stereotactic radiation, let him recover from that, and then we take him back to the operating room. This is after his um, uh, transarterial therapy, and then we take him back laparoscopically and go ahead and ablate uh, all 10 of those lesions. And he actually did very, very well. And finally, this is one of the nurses in our hospital was taken. We thought we were going to operate on her for about eight lesions in her liver. And this is not uncommon at all in neuroendocrine tumor, is that you wind up finding multiple small lesions throughout the liver that you would never find on any imaging, even some of the best, you know, go to tape scan, all, you'll never see them. 
So that's why we believe that surgical approach to liver-directed therapy will help you identify these lesions. And so she wound up having about 50 lesions in her liver. And fortunately, with modern technology, we're able to sit there and treat all 50 of them in a single setting. And actually, believe it or not, I saw her Thursday, and this was seven years ago, and she's still no evidence of disease and completely asymptomatic seven years after having 50 lesions treated. And this is what her skin looked like, all completely avoided. Now, I'm not saying that everybody with 50 lesions is a candidate for this, but when you get the um, uh, dogmatic, you have bilobar disease, blah, 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 too large volume of disease, you know, I'm not sure if I would accept that every single time as an answer and maybe ask a few more questions regarding uh, modern HPV. Now, again, with microwave, we're still making our advancements. I'm very involved in the process of engineering of antennas and systems. But I think that we're going to continue to develop these technologies in an attempt to try to fight some of these diseases. So that's from a liver point of view. And so the other part of my life is pancreas. Now, pancreas is a completely different beast than the liver. And, you know, the liver, you can, you can pretty much kick it around pretty good, and it'll take a lot, kind of like the stomach, kind of like your bladder. Pancreas doesn't like to be messed with at all. It's, it's so special. So it doesn't like to be messed with. And so some of the techniques and technologies that we use on the liver are not appropriate whatsoever for the pancreas. The pancreas does not like to be heated up, or it doesn't like to be frozen. Uh, so high ablation, RF, microwave, really can only be used in a very, very, very limited and very selected situation. But for the most part, we don't use those technologies on the pancreas. When we talk about pancreatic resections, one of the most common things that you'll hear um, is pancreatico duodenectomy. And sort of the acronym or the name that goes along with that is Whipple. So the Whipple procedure. So Alan Whipple here at Columbia was the first person to successfully do in the United States a pancreatico duodenectomy. And back then, it was a two-stage two operation. They did the resection on one day, the reconstruction on the next day, and the mortality from that was about 40 to 50 percent. That was back uh, in the early days, around the 1940s and 50s. And since that time, we've come a long way when it comes to doing pancreatic duodenectomies, and so that our, our mortality is in the single digits, you know, 3 percent is less than my hospital. Dr. Whipple, with all due respect, that was not the first person to do pancreatic duodenectomy. It's a German surgeon, Dr. Kausch, who was the first person to actually do it. Even though it gets tagged Whipple procedure, um, Kausch was actually the first one to do it. There's lots of different steps in doing a Whipple procedure, but what do we generally do? You're taking out basically half the pancreas. In the olden days, we used to take out half the stomach. Modern centers that do hepatobiliary surgery will preserve the stomach unless there's tumor in the duodenum or involved at that margin. But we generally try to preserve the stomach. That's called the pylorus preserving ripple. So if you need a ripple, God forbid, hopefully you'll have a pylorus preserving ripple. And we take out half the pancreas and the entire duodenum, bile ducts, all the lymph nodes in the area. We can't, unfortunately, in most patients, particularly with neuroendocrines, just go in and take the tumor out. We can sometimes do that with islet cell tumors, but for overall for neuroendocrines, that's not an option. We have to take everything out. It's a regional operation. So if you have a primary duodenal carcinoid that's invading into the head of the pancreas, you need a Whipple operation. Um, this is just what it looks like. We're very aggressive when it comes to Whipples, and we do a lot of vascular resection, vein resections, arterial resections, and about 25% of our Whipples, and we do about 100 Whipples a year, about 25% of those are with major vascular resections and reconstructions, which is a fairly high number for the United States. But again, we're able to extend what we do with resectional therapy for tumors in the head of the pancreas or the duodenum with, again, more modern techniques. But again, just like there has been minimally invasive liver surgery, we also do minimally invasive pancreatic surgery. And there's lots of roles for laparoscopy when it comes to the treatment of patients with um, pancreatic diseases, not only neuroendocrine, but others. And certainly from a resection point of view, we can remove the body and tail. A little bit more controversial is doing a laparoscopic Whipple procedure. Um, very few centers in the United States do that. We actually do that uh, with the assistance of uh, a robot. And uh, again, we'll, we need a little bit more time to look at those outcomes and compare uh, morbidity and mortality. There's a lot more issues from a GI point of view. It's a little bit more straightforward with liver. But again, all of these procedures are potentially uh, able to do uh, in a minimally invasive way, which again, uh, minimizes uh, morbidity and uh, illness for the patient. So again, there's a typical neuroendocrine tumor sitting out there in the body and the tail of the gland. And when it comes to a procedure that involves the body and tail, there's a lot, you'll hear just a pancreatectomy, but there's lots of variations on that theme. I think that's outside the scope of this particular talk. 
Um, and again, rather than having a big up and down incision or a big, you know, Chevron incision or Mercedes Benz incision or retracting your liver, you know, generally you're going to have four incisions that are anywhere from five millimeters to ten millimeters in size. And I think from a healing point of view, wound infection point of view, pain point of view, it's a lot less. Lots of steps when you're going through the liver, but absolutely 100% we are so incredibly dependent on intraoperative ultrasound. And that in itself is a huge skill that needs to be uh, known and the surgeon needs to be able to do that very well. So again, when we are doing everything laparoscopically, we lose our ability to touch. So we can't touch and we can't feel anymore. So we can't feel blood vessels, we can't feel tumors. And so now ultrasound basically takes the place of our hand. So now we visually see the location of the tumor, where it is relative to the blood vessels and other things. So it's absolutely critical. And it also helps us maybe identify lesions that we're not seeing on preoperative imaging, despite the best preoperative imaging. So ultrasound is absolutely critical. So here's a patient um, with a neuroendocrine tumor sitting in the back of the pancreas. And if you can indulge me, I'll run you through about a two, three minute video here. Now, unlike the liver, where the liver is right in the front, right in your face, pancreas is all the way in the back. So we have to get things out of the way. So it's sitting behind the stomach and behind the, um, the mesentery of the transverse colon. So we have to move things out of the way just to get down to the pancreas. Now, there are some structures around the pancreas that, you know, the pancreas doesn't like to be messed with and some structures that don't like to be messed with. This is the ultrasound. You can clearly see that dark circle to the right, and that's the tumor itself. You can't see it from the front. So very important for us to be able to identify the lesion, its location, where it is relative to the major blood vessels. So some pretty significant structures in those areas, and damaging those vessels um, is counterproductive, let's just say. Um, and so what we want to do is we need to mobilize. You have to be very gentle with the pancreas. You can't rough it up. You can't manhandle it. It bleeds. It, it just doesn't like to be messed with at all. Um, when we do these procedures, whether it be on the liver or the pancreas, sometimes by manipulating the tumor, we might be sending um, uh, hormones into your bloodstream. So it's generally a good idea to try to block that before you start manipulating a tumor. So all of our patients will get a triotide. Uh, intravenously as at the beginning of the operation to try to minimize the carcinoid crisis. And fortunately, not on good, but we haven't had to deal with that too many times. So again, things that the surgeons need to be thinking about proactively uh, to try to minimize the risks. So what we've done is we've uh, excluded the blood vessels. Uh, there's the splenic artery, which runs along the top of the pancreas, and the splenic vein runs behind the pancreas. And again, with uh, you can see this is all no hand assist, and that's just another stapling device there sort of the crux or the bane of our existence is cutting the pancreas in half. And again, with modern stapling devices, with or without staple line reinforcement and variable height staplers and all that, we can actually transect these pancreases very well, alone or in combination with an energy device, uh, because the biggest risk of a pancreas is either a pancreatic leak or pancreatitis. And the risk of that in the modern era is actually fairly low. Does it happen? Of course it does. But frequency of that is fairly low. And then again, we use the uh, our energy devices and a combination of a variety of techniques to remove the rest of the pancreas. In this particular situation, we preserved the arteries and we preserved the blood vessels to the spleen, so the spleen did not need to come out because it was a small low grade tumor, and then we blew it up at the end. So if you look at outcomes associated with resection for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, you can see there in the upper study, 72 patients, you know, five, this is pancreas only disease, not liver metastases associated with it that you can have a five-year disease-specific survival of about 90% having the tumor removed. So, well, I'm here talking about laparoscopic surgery. So this is a meta-analysis looking at the lower study. is meta-analysis looking at laparoscopic versus open pancreatic resections for neuroendocrine tumors. You can see 11 studies, about 900 patients. You can see the incidence of lap versus open. But interestingly, complication rate significantly lower in the laparoscopic group uh, blood loss is lower in the laparoscopic group, and length of hospital stay is five days shorter in the laparoscopic group versus open. And fortunately, there is no oncologic disadvantage to doing a laparoscopic liver section for pancreatic neuroendocrine to open. So it seems like a win-win all the way around, just a lot of surgeons aren't fully trained on how to do that. All right, one more section for you. We talked about, there's no way that I cannot talk about ablation, even if I'm talking about something else. And so sort of the newest kid on the block is irreversible electroporation. Has anybody heard about this particular technology? Okay, this is, this is a little bit different. There's only a few centers in the United States that do this, including ourselves. And I'm on the panel managing IRE and 
trying to figure out its correct role working with the FDA in terms of pancreatic disease. As I mentioned, when we're talking about pancreas specifically, pancreas really doesn't like to be heated up. Okay? And so, again, oftentimes tumors are unresectable or patients are not good candidates for big pancreatic resections. So again, is there a way we can potentially destroy tumors without heating up the tumor or the pancreas and keeping it at a relatively low risk and safe? And so IRE is a little bit different than RF. RF puts current through your body. What we do with IRE is we place anywhere from two to six, usually around four electrodes, and we're basically pulsing energy between the electrodes. So the, the voltage is pretty high. We're looking at around 3,000, 3,500 volts pulsed uh, at around 90 uh, microseconds, or milliseconds, excuse me. Um, and we're pushing a current of up to 50 amps. So that's a lot of juice being pumped through. And basically what it does is it, it punches holes in the cells and then it triggers those cells to cell death. Now there's a lot of parameters. So what we want to do is we want to, if we don't put enough energy in, you'll have tumor that stays alive. If we put too much energy in, we get uh, heat and we don't want that. And so we want that sort of sweet spot, the Goldilocks zone, where we're destroying cancer cells, but we're not heating up the tissue. And this is what our OR looks like. On the right is the ultrasound machine, in the middle is the IRE machine, on the left is the microwave generator, and that's what a modern HPV operating room looks like. Um, there's lots of parameters that we use. I think that's outside the spectrum of this talk. And again, what we're doing is we're pulsing electrons through the tumor to blow holes in the cells. And if you need a little bit of a better visual, think about it this way. So, um, don't tell anybody, this is why I didn't want to put it on YouTube because I don't know if this is copyright infringement. But the, um, so this is a scene from a very popular movie, and imagine that, see those, um, the, the gravity, excuse me, the, um, the, uh, the debris field that's come blowing through, and think of the International Space Station as the tumor, and so you get streams of electrons just coming through and just pummeling everything in its sight. And so that's kind of the visual for what IRE does to tumors. Love that. So, um, what are the potential roles for IRE? Well, we can use it, it's FDA approved for any soft tissue ablation, but specifically very good for certain uh, selected pancreatic tumors, and then adjacent to important structures that we can't treat with RF or microwave, such as portal structures where the bile duct and blood vessels are, uh, hepatic veins, uh, important mesentech vessels, uh, where if you damage them, survival is not there. So this would be an example of somebody that I would say most People, most surgeons would say it is completely unresectable. The orange arrow points to a, a little soft tissue density, and that big white thing is the superior mesenteric artery. That is the artery that gives the entire blood supply to your entire GI tract. So if anything happens to that artery, all your intestines die. And there's tumor wrapped around that. And that's not surgically resectable, and we can't microwave or RF that. And that's a good situation, and that's where we use IRA. So again, this is what it looks like. Fortunate, unfortunately, uh, we can't do IRE uh, laparoscopically. Well, not in the pancreas yet. That's still being worked on. Uh, and then what we do is, it's not a great, it doesn't really happen in this video. But again, what we need to do is we need to put these needles, generally four needles in, right around the most important arteries in your abdomen. Uh, and so precision to the millimeter is absolutely important. And then what we do is we pulse the energy through, and you'll see the sort of body twitching a little bit. You have to be completely paralyzed for this. Use a lot of narcotics in the operating room. The body doesn't like it a whole lot. And there's the needle right there. Um, and then we pulse our energy through, just for the sake of time, and then keep on rolling. Now, postoperatively, this is what we see. So there is the tumor that was right adjacent to the superior mesenteric artery, a very important artery. And post-op scanning, you can see that that's all destroyed now. So again, that's specifically a situation where we had no treatment options. And so if you look at some of the results for local advanced pancreatic cancer, um, there seems to be some advantage to IRE. We don't have a lot of data with neuroendocrine. But again, just letting you know that it does seem to be somewhat effective, uh, and this is early data, uh, for a much worse disease. So what are the clinical roles for IRE and neuroendocrine? certainly non-resectable pancreatic tumors to enhance a surgical margin. So say we take out most of the tumor, but we need to clean up a margin that's say on the celiac axis. Uh, anything with vascular involvement, the major blood vessels, celiac axis, SMA, SMV, mesenteric vessels, uh, intrahepatically in the liver, uh, the major blood vessels that travel along with the bile ducts. 
So this is just, again, one of my patients who laid along the superior mesenteric artery. There's the aorta, is the white circle, and the SMA is the white above. And there's a tumor sitting right there at the SMA. And again, if we try to resect that, we cannot resect that with a negative surgical margin. You'd have to take the artery, which would wipe out all your intestines. So again, that's a situation where we'll go into the mesentery, and we were able, and that's a very common problem, by the way, with uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Really, you'll, you'll get mesenteric metastases. Uh, we're able to treat that with uh, IRE. Well, from the liver point of view, this is a, a neuroendocrine tumor. We did a liver resection on the right, and you can see there's a tumor there, and those little white squiggly lines, that's the left hepatic vein and the middle hepatic vein. And again, if we try to blast that with microwave, there's a chance we can clot off those veins. We've seen thrombus go all the way up into the heart. Again, maybe not the best thing in the world, and that would be a situation where we'd strongly consider using IRE rather than another ablative technology where somebody would tell you, like at the NIH, that, um, that this is not an ablatable tumor, and I would certainly argue that point. So it's very early on in the uh, process with IRE. We're really learning it as we're going. Um, we're continually working on it in our lab in terms of developing improved mathematical algorithms. We're trying to figure out how to enhance that with drug elution locally, uh, and we're also developing the next generation uh, IRE device in our, in our thing. So, you know, what was, what's the future going to look like when it comes to liver surgery and ablation technologies? You know, this is what I think about every day. I'll be on the train today, and that's what I'll be thinking about to try to figure out how to make it better. But I do know that the future definitely looks bright. So do not give up hope because you've got very dedicated people who've committed their entire lives to trying to fight these horrible diseases in the best way we can. And so I think that liver-directed therapy is certainly a well-established uh, in the uh, importance of cancer care. Minimally invasive interventions are becoming more and more popular with less morbidity. Um, I think it's important to view the certain technologies that I'm referring to today and others, such as transarterial therapy and systemic therapy, as complementary. They should not be competitive with one another. Obviously, patient selection and working out a complete care plan for that individual is most important. That does take a multidisciplinary team. You know, you don't want this. With I'm a hammer, you're a nail, and that's what you're going to get. You don't want that. What you want is this. You want a patient-centered approach to care where you have multiple specialties looking in, and then what we do is we go argue and arm wrestle in the back room to figure out uh, a care plan for an individual patient. So again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart from the HPV surgery team at Carolina's Medical Center. I appreciate your attention, and I hope uh, we're able to give you a little bit of information as, as you're moving forward in your journeys. Thank you.